Well, thank you everybody for coming this afternoon. Uh, it's great to see so many fellow Americans interested in one of the core aspects of our, our Ohio constitutional tradition. For those who don't know, my name is Lee Strang and I'm the director of the Institute of American Constitutional Thought and Leadership, which is sponsoring today's event. And I'm gonna say a few words first to introduce the Institute and then also to introduce our, our distinguished speaker today. So the Institute is a multidisciplinary university center that conducts research, teaching, public programming concerning the core texts and great debates of Western civilization, the principles and ideals of American and Ohio political orders, and the foundations of responsible leadership and informed citizenship. It was started in 2023 as an independent academic unit of the university. And in the short time, we've already laid the foundation for a lot of benefits to our students, to the, to the, to the citizens of Northwest Ohio. Part of it's the programming. Uh, so this is our third event. Uh, this, no, this is actually our fourth event this semester. Our next event is actually going to be on April 9th, so mark your calendars. It's a conversation on the future of higher education in light of students who are fair admission versus Harvard. The Institute is also offering its first classes. So for those who are law students, we have some literature over there. We're offering uh, three classes this summer, so our first classes. One is freedom of expression in times of crisis. So to the extent that you think there's pressure on freedom of expression today, this would be a course for you. Uh, from Rags to Riches, How America Became an Economic Superpower, taught by an economic department faculty member, uh, American Economic History. And then Ohio Constitutional Law, taught, taught by myself. Uh, and just one little plug on that, we're gonna have a number of guest speakers. I'm trying to wrangle Mr. Melhorn to be a guest speaker as well, given his expertise. But we'll also have Justice DeWine coming uh, to give uh, a uh, one of the guest uh, talks as well. Um, this fall, we're gonna start Institute Faculty Research and Scholarship. And I'm gonna do a soft reveal here. So one of the partnerships that we are entering into is with Oxford University to work with them to make available all of the documents relevant to the Ohio constitutional tradition to the world. And we'll offer student fellowships, uh, we'll offer faculty support for students and faculty participating in that as a way to, uh, for them to do their own research and writing. Uh, it's my pleasure as well to introduce Dr. Michael Gonzalez. Dr. Gonzalez is our Institute uh, Executive Director. Uh, he just came on board Two weeks ago, was it, Michael? Uh, uh, he, he came roundabout, he's from Texas originally, and, uh, and came roundabout uh, through Princeton, uh, now to, uh, to, to the University of Toledo. He'll be here full time starting this, starting this summer. Uh, you could tell Michael was from Texas because when he came to interview, he was wearing cowboy boots. <laughs> it's funny, I told my wife, I was like, you can tell he's from Texas. One last note before I introduce our speaker, I want to recognize Mr. Dick Walensky, who is on our academic council. The academic council is the, the, the group of, uh, people that, that selects directors and, and selects directors of the Institute, and all of the different centers in Ohio have academic councils. Ours is the first one to get off the ground, and thank you, Mr. Walensky, for your service. It's my pleasure to introduce Donald Frank Melhorn, who is our speaker uh, this afternoon. He's a graduate of Yale University and Harvard Law School, and he's a veteran of the U.S. Navy, uh, and has been, of course, in practice since 1964. Uh, he's currently of counsel with the firm Marshall Melhorn, where he divides his time between active practice, primarily focused on nonprofit client organizations, and practice, and in his words, practicing legal history without a license. As an author, teacher, lecturer, and participant in efforts to help the organized bar foster interest in Ohio legal history. Mr. Melhorn is the author of numerous articles and books. Uh, one of my favorites is Lest We Be Marshaled, Judicial Power and Politics in Ohio, 1806 to 1812. His most recent publication is a book-length modern edition of Frederick Grimke's The Rights of Women in a Democratic Republic. And Mr. Melhorn recently finished the fascinating essay From Conflict to, to Chaos to Concord, which is the subject of his remarks today. Uh, well, thanks, everybody. Uh, this is a pleasure and um, a, a, a unique experience, really, for me. Um, I, um, it was shortly after I began practice that I somehow learned that during the first decade after statehood in 1803, two Ohio judges were separately tried by impeachment for decisions claiming and exercising the power to pass on the constitutionality of acts of the Ohio legislature. That power, the power of judicial review, was controversial. And opposition to it included impeachment threats against judges who supported it. Marshall, for his decision in Marbury versus Madison, was the recipient of some of those threats and also state court judges. 
that had spoken about the application of the power of judicial review in their work in reviewing state laws. But only in Ohio were those threats carried out. In the prosecutions of Ohio Supreme Court Judge George Todd and Common Pleas Court Judge, I'm sorry, Common Pleas Court Presiding Judge, and I'll tell you in a minute what that means, Calvin Pease for rulings in two cases invalidating the same Ohio Legislative Act as unconstitutional. Their impeachment trials were conducted separately, back to back, in January 1809. Judge Todd's first, with the same outcome in Judge Pease's case, acquittal by a majority one vote short of the two-thirds required for conviction in, in impeachment. The political reaction was extreme, unprecedented, and destabilizing. The act in question is called the $50 Act, and it increased to that amount the small claims civil jurisdiction of Ohio Justices of the Peace, up from $20 at the time of statehood in 1803. Cases within the margin of that increase from $20 to $50, which had formerly been heard in the common pleas courts where jury trial was available, were thus transferred to magistrates whose proceedings were conducted informally, without juries. In deference to the Ohio Constitution, which had a Bill of Rights where the grant of jury trial was, quote, inviolate, the $50 Act provided for appeal of justice of the peace decisions to the Court of Common Pleas for jury trial de novo, that is, as if the trial had never occurred before the justice, subject, however, to giving bond to pay the resulting judgment. And it was by that bonding requirement that the $50 Act was claimed to be unconstitutional as imposing an additional and impermissible burden on the right to get to the jury. But there was very little in the real world of Ohio at that time that that right could have applied to. The, uh, the problem was that if, uh, well, first of all, we're dealing here for the most part with collection cases. And then, as now, collection cases usually don't have any issue of liability. The problem is getting payment. But in those days, if uh, a person was brought before a justice of the peace and wished to contest liability, the last place they would want to be would be before a jury in the Court of Common Plea. Because the evidence for the plaintiff in a collection case is almost always documentary. It's on paper, so, uh, something that was signed or a business record. Whereas the contest of liability is almost always oral testimony. Whose testimony? The, the debtor's. But there was a, law, a rule of evidence that existed in Ohio for throughout, at least up until the 1850s, that prohibited parties from testifying on their own behalf in court. Prohibited. So the last place anybody would want would be to take a collection case to a, a contest in the Court of Common Plea. Each of the Ohio cases in which that allegation of, of uh, burden was asserted involved proceedings in Steubenville, in the Jefferson County Court of Common Pleas. In the first case, Rutherford versus McFadden, the uh, Ohio Supreme Court Judge Todd, I'll give you, here's, here's Todd, wait a minute, I've got to pick, wait a minute, here he is. Uh, was impeached for his part in the two-to-one decision of the Supreme Court 
in uh, Rutherford versus McFadden, that was the Supreme Court case in 1807, reversing a judgment of the Common Police Court of Steubenville against judicial review, which had <laughs> held the con either held the Constitution, uh, the $50 Act constitutional, or disclaimed power to determine its constitutionality. The, here's Todd. The presiding judge of the Court of Common Pleas in Steubenville was Calvin Pease, P-E-A-S-E, -E, um, who heard or who was involved in the second case, uh, and he was, he was impeached for his part in a three to one judgment of his court in the cost award cases favoring judicial review, which had reversed a previous judgment of that court, which had held the same law unconstitutional in a decision that he published in this uh, newspaper. I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. Uh, what happened was there, we, we're dealing with two cases here. Rutherford versus McFadden in 1807 in the Supreme Court, uh, which reversed Jefferson County for a decision against judicial review and a second case that did not reach the Ohio Supreme Court that was decided in Judge Pease's court in which a three to one decision of his court held the same case constitutional. And so the Supreme Court didn't see that case, but instead that was the one for which Judge Pease was impeached, uh, tried by impeachment. Uh, how he got tried was that he caused his case to be published in the Scioto Gazette, which is a newspaper still in, in print and still continuing in Chillicothe, which was then the state capital. And Pease published this decision in the state capital when the legislature was there during the winter for its uh, annual session that lasted about six weeks or eight weeks during the winter, winter months. He knew when he published this case that it was very likely to result in his impeachment. And in fact, he published it in order to bring something to the legislature's attention, which I had always thought was the fact that his court had, had um, it, it, by reversing itself, had come out for judicial review. But when I got into it recently, and it was in preparing for the, this book that, or, or uh, article that I had published, that I really found that, that Pease had a different motive for putting this case in the, in the, uh, in the paper. Um, his, uh, the problem was uh, that it was a, an intolerable threat to his position as presiding judge of his common pleas court. Presiding judges were a feature of the original uh, system of Ohio courts. In the counties, each county had a, or, or the, the county common pleas court consisted of a presiding judge and either two or three associate judges. The associates were civilians, they were uh, people uh, of repute in the community, uh, but without legal training. That is, they, they were not members of the bar, not expected to be members of the bar. Uh, the presiding judge, on the other hand, was always a, a lawyer admitted to the, the bar, and that was Pease. And his court in Steubenville had three associates, which made a difference because when the court had two associates, a total of three judges, the presiding judge could always be overruled by his associates. And when, there, when, the, uh, when the court had three associate judges, it met the requirement for a quorum and therefore could hold court in the absence of the presiding judge. And that's what happened in the first case when this court held against judicial review. So the second case came up for judicial review and Judge Pease was not only uncomfortable with that case, he found that he could not tolerate it. And the, uh, the um, yeah, let me, 
let me not get ahead of myself. The problem was, for the presiding judge who was a lawyer, was that if you start letting your associates overrule you, particularly on questions of law, you have lost control, at least of that part of the proceedings of your court. And of course, this can be different in each county in which you serve, because the associates were local to the county, not uh, the same in all of the, the courts of the circuit. And so uh, the, the presiding judge was in the position, if he allowed this to happen, of having to uh, apply law that he did not agree with in, in, in conflict with a constitutional duty which he had sworn to uphold. And he, uh, the system would be uh, such that there would be a different result in every case depending on what the associates in that court decided their view of the law would be. And this extended not only beyond questions of law, but the question of who ran the actual court proceedings. And interestingly, uh, that issue had arisen concurrently in Pennsylvania, where exactly that kind of a case had arisen, and the presiding judge was complaining that the issue in this, in my impeachment trial in this case, was who really runs the Court of Common Pleas in the ex county of Pennsylvania and so forth. And it was that. Um, uh, that concern, I think, that um, Pease uh, was prompted to offer himself to the legislature for impeachment by persuading his court to uh, overrule its previous decision and instead come out for judicial review, uh, which resulted in, a, uh, in the impeachment trials of not only uh, Todd, who was tried for his part in reversing the first case in the court, and Pease, who was tried for the second case that never got to the court of, of uh, the Supreme Court. Um, the, the, the lawyer that was involved in the proceedings in the first case, in other words, the lawyer who was uh, seeking reversal of the Common Pleas Court's first decision against judicial review, was clearly uh, an exceptionally distinguished and capable uh, member of the bar, uh, Charles Hammond. Uh, he was, had a newspaper background, uh, not much in the way of formal legal education. And uh, he was the, the counsel who took the appeal to the Supreme Court in Rutherford versus McFadden. When he did that, that case and his representation in that case came to dominate the statewide scene in terms of the, how this issue was perceived. And so it was Todd's uh, impeachment, not Pease's, that was tried first and commanded most attention because of, because of Hammond. Uh, Hammond uh, not only was uh, uh, prominent as counsel for, for uh, um, the appellant in Rutherford versus McFadden, but he was also um, uh, the, uh, the spokesman for uh, judicial review in general in, in, in for its acceptance in Ohio. Uh, the Supreme Court's of, uh, reversal of, of um, in Rutherford versus McFadden, uh, which then brought the court three judges in the Ohio Supreme Court in favor of, uh, uh, of judicial review by its two to one decision, then became the focus of, of publicity. Uh, a lot of commentary uh, in the newspapers, mostly against judicial review by correspondents who, uh, according to the custom of their time, identified themselves with pseudonyms, just as the correspondents in in the Federalist Papers did. Remember Publius and so forth? And so, forth. And so uh, people like Farmer and, and, uh, and Mechanic and, and so forth were writing letters uh, which were published. Uh, these were lengthy letters and, and very substantive. And uh, that was part of the background which brought this controversy more seriously before the legislature 
which had looked at it before and kind of punted it in earlier sessions because they had more important things to, to deal with. One of them was another common police judge who uh, had a problem getting to the uh, sessions of his court because of his horse um, uh, menagerie. Uh, or, or, uh, the, he, he couldn't get a horse that would, could, swim, could swim the rivers in Ohio, which is what horses had to do for the judges of the time. Uh, that, and uh, the, the, uh, the legislature was not inclined to accept his excuse or the difficulty of doing that. Um, so it, it, uh, it was in 188, which was the year after the Supreme Court had come down uh, for judicial review in M Rutherford versus McFadden, that uh, the Ohio House uh, uh, debated it extensively and passed a resolution proposed by Thomas Worthington who was a great name in Ohio, of early Ohio history, uh, had been uh, primarily responsible for the politics of getting Ohio admitted to the Union, and was back home about to run for governor, and uh, in the legislature proposed a resolution, uh, of course, against the, the, doc the doctrine of judicial review. Uh, the trial uh, was held the following year of, of the two impeachment cases, uh, this is the State House. Uh, the building no longer exists. Uh, it was the first permanent structure erected in, in uh, Chillicothe. It had been used for territorial um, proceedings before statehood. And the, uh, the, uh, the House met in, in the bottom floor and the Senate met in the top floor, and that's where the trial was, attended by all of the House members, so it must have been quite a crowd in the room. Uh, the trial lasted uh, for two weeks, and Todd was defended by uh, a very distinguished group of six Ohio lawyers who each did something that was relevant to this defense. Uh, the first thing they did uh, in the newspapers before the trial started was to concede that the Supreme Court had been wrong in holding the $50 Act unconstitutional, that the requirement for bonding was not sufficient to cause uh, an impediment that denied the constitutional right of jury trial. And of course, there never was a case in which a claimant claiming that right was protesting it in court. Um, the, uh, uh, also, they recognized that uh, if, if the trial was about judicial review, there was no hope uh, that uh, the, the judge they were defending would be uh, acquitted by the, uh, um, in other words, uh, the, it looked like the prosecution had a slam dunk. And that's the way the House figured it because they turned down a motion to hire outside counsel who knew how to conduct a litigation. What Todd's counsel did was to use a, a, a device that experienced defense counsel today sometimes get a chance to use when the prosecution is guilty of overcharging so that the defense can try the crime that they can prove that they, their client was innocent of and hope that the jury would forget about the crime that the client <clears throat> would have difficulty proving his innocence of. And that's exactly how this impeachment trial was conducted by very skilled counsel who argued that uh, it's wrong to impeach a judge for a mistaken decision that he makes honestly. The indictment, the impeachment indictment had accused him of essentially accused him of bad faith, of conspiring to overthrow a constitutional government in the state of Ohio. And one of the arguments that his counsel made was to point to members of the legislature who had voted in the minority against the $50 Act's, $50, $50 Act's passage, claiming as their personal opinion that it was unconstitutional, and here were these guys sitting uh, a couple of them in the Senate in, uh, that were trying them, and very hard to sell the idea that, that, that George Todd was corrupt of any, was guilty of any corrupt or evil motive. And so 
the decision came down of acquittal by a majority vote for conviction, that is a majority against judicial review. And this was uh, extremely troubling to the legislators uh, who did not expect that result and who were uh, in the position uh, that of complete frustration because there was no place they could go legally to challenge this, uh, this, uh, this verdict. Um, if it had been possible at that time to amend the Ohio Constitution as it can be amended today by a resolution passed by the legislature by some kind of supermajority and then ratified by the voters, that would have been done. And the Worthington resolution against judicial review would have been implanted in the Ohio Constitution. And then you can speculate about how many other states' constitutions would have had the same resolution as the Ohio system began, went west. Uh, in, in. Because no, nobody at that time was concerned about judicial review in relation to protecting individual rights. Their only concern was about the doctrine as, a, uh, as it affected the distribution of government powers. Excuse me for not turning this off. Uh, and so uh, a, a great danger was actually av avoided. But the, the lawyers that, uh, that uh, prosecuted or defended the, uh, the judges were so concerned, and of course the same result happened in Pisa's case as was expected, that um, they feared that the legislature would simply shut down and go home and leave the session Un, with, with the normal needs of continuing the Ohio government unprovided for. In other words, go on strike. And so they did something that was really extreme, and that is that under Hammond, they got the leading lawyers together, in two, including several that had participated in, uh, in the um, defense of Todd, and published again in the newspaper basically a letter on behalf of the entire Ohio bar saying, well, the Supreme Court might have been mistaken in holding the $50 Act unconstitutional, so we are not going to challenge it anymore, and we will conduct our own practices as though it were in full force and effect. So in essence, the court was so concerned that it was driven to overrule the bar of the Supreme Court to overrule its uh, Supreme Court. And so here's the letter uh, published or signed by Hammond. And the next signature is an interesting one, Lewis Cass, who became a famous uh, character later on the national scene uh, in America. I think he was both Secretary of State and Secretary of War and frequently talked about as a Democratic candidate for president. Then this wasn't enough. So the next year, the legislature comes back, and that's when the shooting started. Uh, they adopted uh, what came to be known as the sweeping resolution. And here was the deal. Uh, the Ohio Constitution provided that judges would be appointed by the legislature. This was a, a, a body of both House and Senate assembling together, and they were the ones that controlled judicial appointment for a term of seven years. It had always been understood that where a judge, as was frequently the case, took office as a successor of another judge who had previously held the job, that his term would start anew, start fresh for another seven years from the time of his appointment. All of a sudden, turning its back on that practice, which had existed up until that time, the legislature said, aha, we have a better idea. And the better idea was that a successor judge is only appointed for what remains of his predecessor's term of office, and indeed, that also can extended back to the term of the predecessor of the predecessor and so forth. And so judges that had been appointed, as were all of the members of the Ohio Supreme Court originally to the three seats in 1803, 
We're now in seats that where the term was about to expire. And guess what? When? In 1810. And by this device, uh, they um, uh, ousted the two members of the Ohio Supreme Court. One was Todd, the other was another judge who had similar views, and uh, proceeded to elect replacements uh, uh, for um, uh, those seats, again, for seven-year term. Well, they would have gotten away with it, except that they had to make the same deal for the associate judges the ordinary citizens, and by that time there were, there were uh, over a dozen that were serving in the common pleas court under the same deal, seven year terms appointed by the legislature. All of them, because there was no complaint about any of their uh, work, were offered new terms, then starting for seven years and so forth. Some of the judges that were given those offers said nuts to that. I am going to sit on this court for the term that I was originally appointed, and I refuse to be sworn under the new commission. So then we began to have common pleas courts in which some of the judge, uh, 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 associates were so-called resolution judges who had go gone along with the New Deal and others insisted on serving under their old commissions and they refused to sit with each other. And so for lack of a quorum, one after the other, common pleas courts became unable to meet at all. Now, there's a great example of that in the court of Greene County. Let's see if I can get that up on here on the screen. Uh, where after this had gone on for a while, it had a bench that consisted of, of Dunleavy, the, the presiding judge, who was a, a, a resolution judge, and two other judge, judges who were newly appointed associate judges, that is, they were unquestionably legal for the seven year terms for which they were appointed. And then there was one of the, of the former, uh, or he would not have described himself as such, um, uh, uh, judges who had, uh, uh, had, had a former appointment and refused to accept a, um, an, a, a new commission. Uh, so here we are uh, in that court. It started out, the, the, uh, the session started out with the Dunleavy and the two newly appointed associates. And then on the third day, uh, Snowden, who was the dissenter who uh, refused to, be, uh, uh, um, to take the new commission, had showed up and demanded to, uh, to take his seat. And Judge Denlevy uh, then called on the sheriff to eject him. The sheriff refused. So the judge called on the coroner to arrest the sheriff and take him to jail, which the sheriff did unresisting. Then Judge Denlevy um, called on the, uh, the, uh, um, the coroner to eject Snowden, and Snowden would not go without resisting. So he was told to call on bystanders for assist assistance. So he calls on one bystander who refuses and is fined $5. He calls on another bystander who refuses and is fined $5. He calls on a third bystander who refuses and pleads uh, infirmity of some kind, and so is excused. And finally, he finds a bystander who is willing to assist the coroner in ejecting uh, Houston by force, which they did, and took him to jail to keep company with the sheriff. Now, that was probably the most extreme uh, case that we know of, but something like that was happening all over. And consequently, the legislature had to come up with, uh, had to realize by 1812 that um, this sweeping resolution wasn't working and, it w and, and they were forced to repeal it. 
The political bargain connected with the repeal is that the judges that were seated under the resolution got to keep their jobs. The judges that were ousted were not restored. And the two primary cases of ouster were, of course, Judge Todd uh, and Pease, who was uh, uh, not ousted by the sweeping resolution, but, but his, he, he was a judge that had, was serving the, his original term of seven years, which expired in 1810. And so he was gone by the expiration of his term. So uh, we had uh, a situation where on the eve of the War of 1812, uh, the uh, uh, we had uh, the sweeping resolution had been repealed, but the judges that had been ousted were not restored to their seats. Uh, so here's what happened in the War of 1812 uh, that certainly diverted everybody's attention in Ohio. We had a series of defeats of, um, of Ohio forces in the War of 1812 until that process of losing. Uh, was uh, uh, reversed here at the Battle of Fort Meigs in, uh, in May of 1813. Uh, the, the general uh, who was in charge of, of Ohio's forces at the battle came back later as a candidate for, for president of the United States, William Henry Harrison. He wasn't president for very long, you recall. And in a, in a speech at Fort Meigs, talking to many veterans, uh, he uh, uh, asks rhetorically, well, who were the people from Ohio that I commanded at this battle? And he rattles off a bunch of groups of civilian life, people from civilian life that, uh, that, um, that they came from. And the first in, the, in that group that he mentioned was lawyers, lawyers with their briefs. And it, it, that becomes understandable when you consider that the, uh, all of the U.S. forces that fought here in, in the war, that is, in the West, had to be lo re recruited locally. And lawyers, by reason of what they did in their normal work, were ideal candidates for significant participation in that, both in the field and, and uh, behind the lines. And among the lawyers that this was true of were our two former judges, Todd and Pease. And uh, Todd uh, became a major in the U.S. Army in its 19th Regiment, which was newly recruited here in Ohio. And Todd's first job was being in charge of recruiting and training those guys. And at the Battle of Fort Meigs, for which he was called up, he participated in what was probably one of the most brilliant small unit maneuvers or uh, uh, engagements in that war. This is uh, from an old painting of the fort and it shows the corner out of which, not the guns, but a sortie was mounted in order to take out, uh, I can't point to it, but you can see what the guns are shooting at back in the woods there, where the British had uh, established a battery that was doing real damage and if allowed to continue would have caused the fort to become untenable. And basically what it was was that the, the guns that they had installed across the river in Maumee uh, were firing round shot and that was being absorbed by the earthworks that were part of the defenses uh, of the fort. And uh, there was no question of doing a frontal assault. That would, that would take too many casualties. So the British had a mortar and howitzer battery here in, in what's now the, the middle of the cemetery next to Fort Meigs. And if you go, go into that cemetery, you can actually find the remnants of the earthworks that were dug for this battery. And that had to be taken out. And Todd was the second in command of the, the party of, of soldiers that uh, uh, took out that battery. It was well defended uh, by British regular troops. And when they did that successfully, uh, it ended the battle because uh, uh, the, the British general uh, had lost uh, to, to capture uh, 
uh, soldiers that he could not spare. And uh, his main way of overcoming the fort now was gone when that battery was taken out. Pease, on the other hand, served as a civilian. And he was known for his uh, horsemanship, his ability to get uh, anywhere on a wonderful horse that he owned. And at the beginning of the war, when Detroit was suddenly captured, and all of a sudden, nobody knew what was happening. All communications were cut off. Pease rode into the abyss as a civilian scout to report back uh, what was going on and to establish some kind of contact between the US forces that were being scrambled together on the east and in the south. Uh, so during that two weeks of, of, of uh, absolute uh, uh, blindness, uh, Pease was the scout that uh, began to get through that. Um, Todd, on the other hand, uh, was, was, uh, was uh, uh, credited in the way that I saw. And consequently, in 1806, both of them had very different uh, situations personally in terms of their political acceptability for office. And so what happened was that uh, Todd is appointed as a presiding, this time, presiding judge of a common pleas circuit. And Pease, on the other hand, was appointed to the Ohio Supreme Court. Uh, in 1816, and both of them were reappointed for additional seven-year terms in 1823. That coincided with a moment in which the Ohio Supreme Court, in particular, simply had to be reformed. The court consisted of three judges, any two could be a quorum, it was required by the Constitution to hold a session in every Ohio County at least once a year. And to do that with the multiplying numbers of Ohio counties, we had almost as many by then as we have now, meant that these guys, these three guys on the Supreme Court split up in, in combinations of two uh, into two different circuits, uh, had to uh, uh, do their constitutional duty by uh, almost uh, being totally occupied nine months of the year in riding around the state holding two judge courts from which there was no possibility of any appeal and consequently conflicts in the decisions of the two judge panels had no means of being resolved. What this meant for Ohio at the time as its economy was becoming transformed into a mercantile economy and money and credit were issues that now concern every Ohio citizen, was that we had to have some uniformity in the rules of money and credit from the ju judicial system which our Ohio Supreme Court was not providing. Uh, the best example of that was uh, the banks. There were uh, so-called wildcat banks at the time that operated without any government charter. The law provided that the obligations uh, to uh, wildcat banks could not be enforced in court. So uh, the, the, then the question was, well, uh, it is, 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 does the Owl Creek Bank of Union County, is it, is it under that law? Well, it is if it's a bank. Owl Creek says, well, it's not, uh, we're not a bank because the law makes a bank anybody that lends money. And what we lend is paper uh, notes that oblige uh, the hold or entitle the holder to go to our counter and get gold and silver. But hopefully they didn't do it through that. And so uh, uh, some courts said, well, that's still money. And some courts said, no, that's not money. So the bank can enforce its, its loans in county X and it could not do so in county Y. That was the kind of problem that was overwhelming our system and required then the legislature, this time without opposition, to adopt in 1823 an act which essentially recreated the Ohio Supreme Court to be the kind of judicial tri tribunal of last resort that it is today and uh, so are other uh, uh, Supreme Courts of the state. And the act provided, as it indicated here on the slide, that, that all four, there were four by that time, judges, would meet together at the end of their circuit session in, in Columbus each year 
to consider uh, important or difficult questions that were certified up from the two-judge panel. Uh, the, the law further provided that the, those decisions had to be reduced to writing, i.e. the judges had to write opinions, and the opinions would then be officially published by an appointed reporter, paid for out of state funds, and guess who was the reporter? Charles Hammond, who was by that time a titanic figure um, represented the Ohio, uh, state of Ohio before the United States Supreme Court and some important litigation there that defined the scope of federal powers. And um, he took over as reporter and he proceeded to go through the draft opinions that he got from the, from the judges on the court in a way that no modern court reporter would ever dare do. And that is he rewrote some of them uh, or refocus some of them, maybe is a better uh, word. And there are a couple of neat examples uh, of that uh, that affect what lawyers do today. For example, the one involving uh, the legitimacy of, of um, uh, contingent fees in, uh, in, in lawyers' representations of clients, uh, which uh, Hammond took from an outright prohibition that came to him in the draft into a narrow decision that said that the only thing that uh, uh, was wrong with it was the uh, a provision that uh, in this case uh, allowed the, jo the lawyer could settle the case without the client's consent. And that, that, that in this, that's what saved the, the, uh, the contingent fees in Ohio. So that brings the story to an end. It was a case of, uh, of Wild West going on here. Uh, and between uh, our two branches of government uh, that didn't like each other, didn't trust each other, and were uh, uh, not ashamed to, uh, um, uh, to throw their weight around, all coming out uh, the right way, and uh, in the case of the careers of the two judges that uh, otherwise would have been sacrificed completely, uh, they got a convenient war to, to perform in, uh, and become heroes, and that solved their problem. So that's basically the story. What, uh, what uh, I did uh, was, first of all, um, I, didn't, I didn't learn all the details until fairly recently, and the first thing I did was go to the Ohio Supreme Court and uh, say, would you like a, uh, to put up on your walls in Columbus a uh, a copy of, of, of the opinion that Judge uh, Tease put, uh, put in the paper. Uh, here is the very interesting masthead of the Ohio Gazette uh, with uh, the, the advertisements first. And they're all advertisements about uh, merchants that, that wanted cash money. They were, that, that, that's what the advertisement said. And then here is the... Um, here is the opinion that was published in the inter interior part of the paper. Problem was that uh, until recently, uh, uh, we knew about this only because of very poor uh, copies by a microfilm that had been made years ago uh, that were in some of the libraries. So we could read this opinion and we knew what it said, but you couldn't, make from those copies anything that you could show anyone. You had to find an actual newsprint copy of the edition of the paper, that, uh, or the, the issue of the paper that, in which the opinion was published. Well, finally I found one over in Massachusetts in a wonderful library uh, that uh, the American Antiquarian Society has of early American newspapers. And just before COVID, uh, I got them to agree to provide a uh, high-resolution scan of that copy, which some people up in Ann Arbor that work with the Rare Book uh, Library up in Ann Arbor were able to restore into a readable uh, uh, copy of the, of the uh, article that we could donate to the Ohio Supreme Court, which we have done uh, for a display in their wonderful building in Columbus. Uh, which is kind of a museum anyway. And that, that's where the project kind of went off the rails because I never was able to get uh, a satisfactory response uh, from the court for doing that. 
Uh, the project is still down there with them. But in the meantime, I got impatient and had this published, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, the, the whole story in, 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 uh, in a different form. But distinctive because it is published with illustrations. And it is published for a readership which is not an academic readership. But it is designed to, to be read and appreciated and enjoyed by, a, by a law students, by ordinary citizens, and by members of our, sitting members of our judiciary who, who don't know a damn thing about any of this. <laughs> and so uh, that's been my, sort of my mission and uh, what eventually found me to this platform to talk about it. So thank you. Um, you I believe you mentioned Charles Hammond had uh, not much in the way of legal education. And I'm wondering, uh, there, there wouldn't have been a law school in what was called Ohio. W what was the qualification to be on the bar, let alone to be a Supreme Court uh, judge or justice? This is an excellent question. And, um, it certainly is worth a, uh, another session like this. Uh, the, the, uh, going back a little bit, the, the, the legal education of the two lawyers, Todd and Pease, were poles apart. Uh, Todd was a graduate of Yale in the class of 1795. And in 1797, he attended what was then the country's only law school which was being taught in, in the town of Litchfield, Connecticut, as a kind of outgrowth of an office, law office teaching practice of a judge named Tapping Reeve. And when Todd was there, the law school had about 20 students, uh, in a, and they met in a building that Reeve had built next to his house. And part of that was a moot court that the students ran. Uh, as they did uh, uh, the debating uh, uh, activities in the, uh, in, in the in clubs at Yale uh, that every student belonged to. And so um, that was, uh, and one of those debates that they had was on judicial review. And in that debate, which was very well recorded, uh, we know that Todd rep represented a side opposite from the side that he uh, took as a judge 10 years later in Ohio. That is, he debated against judicial review in that student debate. So you had, uh, on the one hand, some judges that had all that was available in the way of institutional education. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, presi or the presiding judge of the Ohio Supreme Court, the other member of the two judge majority, uh, uh, Judge Huntington, uh, was also a Yale graduate, but not a Litchfield graduate. Um, on the other hand, you had people like Hammond, who were very able, very learned, very well informed, but noth and nothing in their background in the way of, of institutional legal education. Uh, Hammond was b professionally a newspaperman, and uh, he had been curious about l l the law, I, I suppose, for a long time, and picked it up in that way. So they, we had lawyers in Ohio that came from both poles of, of education. And the interesting thing to me is that I have never found in any of the literature that I have read that dates from this era, a, a lawyer talking about where, uh, where he went to college or anybody in any way recognizing that X went to college and Y did not. So the sensitivity that we now see in our profession about uh, the, the, uh, this degree snobbery, if you will, that, 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 that we have in, in the profession and so forth, absolutely did not exist at that time. That all of the lawyers that were active in Ohio took each other for what they showed, what they demonstrated in their practice, and not from where they came from, or where they went to school. And uh, it's an important point. Thank you for asking that question. Thank you.